your halo. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're live, so don't say anything uh, too outrageous at the moment. Uh, we'll, I'll wait a couple minutes for people to file in the room, but um, we are technically speaking to the world on the internet right now. Wow. <laughs> the whole wide world? The whole, well, whoever tuned in. So usually we get a few hundred, pe a couple hundred, a few hundred people uh, tuning in as we do the thing. And then, and you add another four, five, six hundred people uh, at once is posted um, on the Santa Rita Hill site and on Facebook. So it's been pretty popular, I guess. I don't know if it's helping anybody sell wine, but I hope so. <laughs> I think we're having a good time. <laughs> we it all high. helps. Every, every time you say something, Matt, it helps. Thank you. <laughs> yes. okay. And I'm learning more about all of this fancy technology. Yes. We're all Zoom experts at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, our kids uh, are. Well, right. Well, in our business, um, we're still, we cannot figure out how to feed people by Zoom. You know, we haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, I imagine, I wonder if the burrito shops up those way, up in the valley are doing better than usual, because that's kind of one of the options you can go for, for, for a staff lunch, right? I mean. Yeah, I bet so. You know, uh, yeah. I don't know. All right. Well, let's, let's start this thing up. Um Welcome, everybody. I am Matt Ketman. Uh, I'm a senior editor at the Santa Barbara Independent and a contributing editor for Wine Enthusiasts. I wore uh, my pith helmet today in honor of, of Frank Astini from the Hitching Post here. He's missing his. Um, he's one of our uh, esteemed guests today, along with his winemaking partner, Gray Hartley, up there uh, on your screen. And then we have Aaron Walker from Pally Wine Company, uh, who's actually Gray Hartley's uh, son-in-law, too. So we can have some... Uh, <laughs> Some family time. It depends on where you are on the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's all backwards. Um, so we have four four fun wines to taste today. And before we dive in here, let's just talk about, we started the series back in June. We've had uh, everyone on from Fiddlehead and Camines of Dreams, Doug Mardrum, Bruce McGuire, Santa Barbara Winery, Dragonette, Liquid Farm, Temperance Cellars, Bucador, Buscador Wines, uh, Greg Brewer, Ken Brown, Rick Longoria, Adam Tolmack, Billy Wathen. We did a special thing with Richard Sanford that actually wow. had some tears involved, which was which was quite nice. Frank was on that one, but he couldn't get his audio to work, so that was <laughs> that was fun. Um, we had Paul Lotto and Tyler Thomas of Deerberg. Yeah. We had Flying Goat and Sea Grape. Um, we had Transcendence and Crawford Family, and now we have Hitching Post and Pally uh, coming up. We're I'm putting one together for October 20th. Haven't quite figured out who that will be yet. I'm thinking maybe a deep dive into Sanford and Benedict, so I'll try to figure that out. Um, on November 10th, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into Mount Carmel and have Mail Road and, and Brian Babcock on, which should be fun. Uh, and then on November 17th, I believe we have the uh, we have Peak Ranch and uh, Spear uh, Vineyards lined up to talk about kind of building their estates from from scratch. So um, today we have a nice mix of uh, kind of the veteran pioneers here, and then Aaron Walker from Pally, who represents uh, you know a I wouldn't say a new brand; it's fairly established now, but you have a newer estate. And so we can kind of get the perspectives on different things. And we're also going to talk about the difference um, between estate wines and, you know, wines from single vineyards and then uh, blends, um, which the two the two pinots that Hitching Posts are pouring uh, for us are, are blended um, from different vineyards. So there's some advantages to that and uh, advantages to estate. So we can kind of cover all of that. Um, without further ado, I guess Aaron, uh, Aaron Walker, uh, welcome to this show or whatever this is called. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your background in this and we can have these guys, because we're going to start with your wine first, since it's a Chardonnay. We're going to start, if you're tasting at home, with the Pally, uh, Pally Wine Cove, um, Pally Vineyard uh, 2017 Chardonnay. All the wines we have today are 2017, so that's kind of fun. Um, and so, Aaron, uh, tell us about how you got in the wine business and how you uh, wound up meeting uh, these guys. And, and uh, I mean, with Gray eventually became your father-in-law and you got a, you got like an official or a semi-official uncle with, with Frank out of that too, I, I imagine. <laughs> um, so tell us how you got involved in the wine business and, and what it was like meeting these guys early on in your career. Yeah, well, um, my involvement comes through restaurants, working in restaurants. And uh, it started in San Diego where I went to college. I went to San Diego State, changed my major multiple times, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life, um, bounced in and out of school. And then uh, long story short, started working at a restaurant in downtown San Diego in 2000, August of 2000, and uh, didn't know much about wine at the at that point. 
but had an interest in working in restaurants and I knew there was something about it that appealed to me. And so I landed this job with this great restaurant company and um, ended up working there for five years. And they did a lot of intensive training. It was a French concept restaurant. So we studied a lot about French wines, French food. Um, but learning about French wines in the regions of France gave me a great basis as far as building my, my knowledge of wines. And um, at the same time, I also met Gray's oldest child, Emily. Uh, she was working there and hired at the same time as I. She was part of the original opening crew of the restaurant. She was a hostess at the restaurant. And after about a year and a half of flirting, it became dating. And uh, from there, you know, the rest is history as, as we would say. But I, uh, over the course of five years working at the restaurant, um, I not only fell in love with Emily, but I also fell in love with wines and was, and, and I was enjoying my, my restaurant work. I was looking at going into culinary school. This is about 2005, 2006. And uh, Emily made the suggestion that her dad might be able to get me a job as a harvest intern. Um, she, having grown up in the area and around wine, knows that during the harvest time of year, wineries are looking to hire temporary help. And I thought that sounded very interesting. So I came up to this area, the Central Coast, poked around. Uh, Gray introduced me to a few, few people. I was offered two different jobs to work harvest in 2006 and um, ended up working for Bonacorsi Wine Company for that first very first job. Um, and then yeah. um, as soon as that harvest ended, I started working for Seth Kunin, um, among other people, Joe Davis as well, uh, but also moonlighting at the Hitching Post restaurant. Um, Frank was kind enough to give me a job as a server there and even more kind to allow me the time off during the harvest season so that I didn't have to work. But when harvest was over and I needed to work again, he was very gracious to allow me to, to come back to work each year uh, once the harvest season ended. So, And did you know uh, much about Hitching Post Wines um, when you started working at that restaurant? Yeah, I did by that point because... No, but having, going back to San Diego, did you know... Oh, going where back did to you learn? Yeah. How did you learn yeah, about so them I, there? I learned about Hitching Post Wines at the same time as I was learning about all wines. Um, in fact, Hitching Post Wines was on the wine list at Royale Brasserie where I was working, which was owned by a King Seafood Company who owns Water Grill and um, some other high-end restaurants. So they've got a, a fabulous wine program. Gray, um, did, all you, around. did you go down and do winemaker dinner down there or something? I mean, you used to tell me about the action going down in San Diego and, you know, it was a little bit incestuous, not incestuous. It, it was uh, Emily and Aaron falling in love and that was part of it. But you used to go down there, right? Oh, I went down there and I bounced around, did some winemaker dinners, but I never did one at the brasserie. Okay. Uh, would have been nice, would have been fun. Uh, but uh, it Dude, was just great. fun watching these kids get together. I And then Aaron you, got to come, go you, when Aaron worked it for Bonacorsi, that would have been right next to us at Central Coast Wine Services when we were still there. So uh, Aaron was at a neighbor, right. a good friend's winery right next to us. Uh, Seth Coonan was in the Central Coast Wine Services at the same time. Um, did you Steve work for Dooley. You didn't work for a red car, did you, Aaron? No, but that was my other job offer. And I, oh. I turned Carol down and I took Bonacorsi, that job instead. I see, yeah. And Gray, wow. Gray, what do you do? What do you when you met Aaron, what did you think? Did you think this guy was gonna end to some extent? You don't need too. to answer that. You don't did you that. did you think he was gonna you know stick it out in the wine business? You must see a lot of people come and get excited and then kind of move on. But did he seem like he had the right stuff from the, from the early days? <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I recognized early on that Aaron was solid and that he was focused and that he was intently interested in uh, all, all things wine, um, not just California wine, but internationally as well. <clears throat> and when he moved up to the central coast and, uh, I had an option to bring him on to Hitching Post Wines, but he was dating my daughter at the time. And well, I, I thought to myself, now, wait a minute. What if this guy turns out to be fantastic and they break up? My, I'm going to be in the middle of it. And then conversely, what if the guy's a dead? He's horrible. <laughs> and they don't break up. And I got to get rid of him. So I, did, I, I was, I was, being pulled both yeah, so neither of like, those things happen. Come on up. <laughs> no, and I, I brought him up. 
Yes. I, so I, I brought him into Central Coast and I said, now this is a great guy to work for. This is a great, don't even think about working for that person and work, <laughs> think about this person. And they're really nice. And, and, and he just, he just took off and the kids flourished. He's done very well. Um, moving right on up and, I'm so proud of him and so tickled to have him uh, as a son-in-law and as a, and a brethren in the wine business. Yeah. And so, so Aaron, uh, how did, uh, what, tell us about Pally, how that gets started. And, and uh, that's really grown really under your watch as far as winemaking and kind of general management goes. So, Yeah, I mean, part of it was being in the right place at the right time and being ready for a great opportunity when it came my way. Um, so I was a year, I'd only been working in the area in wine for about a year, it was 2007 when I learned about a job opening at Pally. And the way I learned about that job was because I was working at the Hitching Post restaurant and Barbara Satterfield, who is intimately involved with this Santa Rita Hills Wine Growers Alliance, who's hosting our event tonight. Um, she also has worked at the Hitching Post for many, many years. And she, she was the one that told me about this job opening and she and I both ended up getting hired to work at Pally in 2007. Um, it was a very young winery, uh, started in 2005, only about 2000 cases being produced at that time. And um, they'd never hired anybody, the owners of Pally who lived down in LA Pacific Palisades area. Um, they had contracted with Brian Loring to make the wines for Pally. So he was making all the wines at his facility. Um, and I was offered a job as a seller hand, which I negotiated up to the title of assistant winemaker with or without Brian Loring's consent. Um, and I, uh, at the same time, they were Pally, the owners, my, still my bosses, um, they were building their own winery just up the road from where Loring was at the present time or at that time. And so I, I saw an opportunity. I knew that these guys were looking to grow and I saw this building being built, this brand new winery, custom built winery that, um, not to make it sound too, too fancy. It's not, it's, it's, a uh, a basic warehouse but it's perfect for winemaking but it's um but anyways i saw a great opportunity there and so i just put my head down and i worked hard and um you know for the first couple of years i had to continue waiting tables at the hitching post to pay the bills and make ends meet but by 2007 uh our owner tim purr um decided that enough, he had had enough of me moonlighting at the hitching post and so he gave me the title of winemaker and came with enough of a raise and also a demand that I stop working at the restaurant because he didn't want his winemaker waiting tables at night. So, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you took, and you... sorry, what'd you say, Greg? Okay. Oh, I was saying, and selling hitching post wines. Right. right. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Schlepping hitching post wines at night while making pally during the day. Yeah. And then you expanded the, I mean, you do a couple of things, well, a number of things really well, but you, you make some of the best, uh, you know, that Huntington Pinot is one of the best Pinots for the money anywhere. Uh, and some of the other, like the, the Riviera one you have, some of the other ones are also great yeah, too, just you. for that, you know, that under $25 price point seems almost impossible to hit uh, in Pinot Noir, although Hitching Post does that a little bit too. Um, and, and you also then expanded the brand into, a lot of single vineyard stuff, and then eventually to your own estate. So take us on that path and how you got to actually planting grapes, which I, I met you out there that one day, just happened to be driving by and you were out there tending to the early vines. And um, <laughs> it's really grown into, you know, a pretty um, extensive vineyard at, at this point. Yeah, that's been eight years since we planted that vineyard. So that was quite a while ago. Um, but yeah, you know, when we first, when Pally first started, it was a focus only on Pinot Noir and only single vineyard Pinot Noirs that were being Grapes were being purchased from various high-end vineyards throughout the area. Um, that was starting in 05. And then we come in a couple years later, come into a big recession. And so that's when we launched what you're referring to as probably our flagship wines now, which is Huntington and Riviera, which are those great value Pinot Noirs that are right around $25 um, or less, depending on where you're buying them. But they're meant to retail at $25. Um, and so we start we start focusing on those while also still producing single vineyard Pinots. Um, but it was, you know, due to demand and the economic, the, you know, economic recession and the times. And um, we found a niche for ourselves and ran with that. And that's what kept us in business and put us on the map and has allowed us to grow and expand. And so 
Um, the next logical step, I mentioned we had already built our own winemaking facility. The next logical step was to plant our own vineyard, which we actually planted two vineyards in the same year in 2012. Um, one in Sonoma, um, which supplies all the grapes for our Riviera Pinot Noir, and then um, our estate property, which is the bigger of the two, it's 50 acres, the one you were referring to, Matt, in Santa Rita Hills, which we call the Pali Vineyard, um, mm -hmm. which is our, which is planted on Barbara Satterfield's family's property on the Machado <laughs> Ranch. So linking Barbara back into this, who I know is watching and in the sidelines. But, um, so we planted 50 acres in Santa Rita Hills in 2012 on a 30 year farming lease. So we don't own the land, but we're leasing it from, from the Machado family. And um it's done. And uh, what's it's the split? Split Pinot Chard, mostly Pinot. Yeah, mostly Pinot. Five, only five acres of Chardonnay. But this year we um, we had to do some replanting due to some Pierce's disease issues. So a lot of our vines had to be replanted. Um, and we took two acres of Pinot out and replaced it with an acre each of Gamay and Dornfelder um, this year. So we now have a little more variety, or we will two years from now. Um, Frank's playing and musical that, chairs there, it looks like. Uh, oh, he got half. his helmet. <laughs> oh, the I, helmet. There it is. <laughs> my, um, my computer battery died, so I had to go on to my Great, iPod. you called that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, so that was a, I don't have to wear the headphones, so I can wear my pit helmet. Oh, there you go. There that you was a pretty yeah. quick, pretty quick uh, digital switch there, Frank. Congratulations. That was, like, seamless. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, if I hadn't pointed it out, you know. I'm not a mute. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, Aaron, tell us about this wine. Anything special you want to note about the 2017 Chardonnay from the vineyard? Um, well, this is only, yeah, only our third third vintage off the property. So we got our first crop, very, very small crop in 2015. And then, um, so this would be, only be our third release. And, uh, you know, Chardonnay in the Santa Rita Hills is beautiful. And we're huge fans of the Chardonnays. From this area um, because they don't need to be overly oaked and they don't need to be put through that full malolactic fermentation if if you inhibit the malolactic and you only use a light amount of oak you allow the minerality um, the acidity the salinity a lot of these really more subtle flavors to shine and to come through in these wines and um, so it we're really proud of our chardonnays it's uh, just seems like unfortunately there's not as much of a market people much prefer to buy red wine, Pinot Noir versus Chardonnay. Um, so we get really excited. I get really excited about our Chardonnays year to year, but um, I always get disappointed that they don't sell as well as I think they should. I think Chardonnay has a bad rap. People expect them to be, you know, the big oaky, buttery bomb style, and that's not what we're going for with ours. So this vineyard's very sandy soils, um, which is typical this part of the Santa Rita Hills, um, almost like just beach, beach sand. Um, and that allows- And that's uh, north, of, north of 246, kind of more or less right in the middle, east to west, essentially. We're we're like the, we're the northwest corner of the northwest. ABA. We're okay. actually pretty far west. Yeah, we yeah. we border um, the Hilliard Bruce property and the, the boundary of the ABA is just to the north of our property and just uh, about a half mile to the west of us. So we're pretty far west. We're actually pretty late ripening there. Um, we're still picking a fair amount of Pinot. We still haven't finished picking at our vineyard. Um, things are just, after that last heat wave, just starting to get really ripe there. Right. Uh, there's a question from uh, someone watching, from Ted. He says, have you had any of the 05, 06, or 07 single vineyard Pinots lately? Oh, from Pally, wow. Yeah. Um, lately, I 05s, no, it's been, probably a year since I've opened an 05. Our, our supply of 05s has dwindled quite a bit. The 06s um, haven't held up quite as well. The 07s are doing pretty nice. I had some of our Russian River um, and Willamette Valley Pinots that we produced from 07 recently. And um, the Shea Vineyard was tasting very good out of Willamette Valley. Um, tasted very like a well-aged, you know, almost like a Burgundy. Um, and then in 07, Russian River Valley um, was a pretty ripe year. And uh, I was surprised at not just Russian River, but Sonoma in general. Uh, the Durrell Vineyard that I opened not too long ago, uh, Pino, was holding up magnificently and still had a lot of fresh fruit to it, which I was really surprised by. So, yeah, um, so yeah I've had a few, a few. And when did you guys open that Funk Zone tasting room? Was that like 2011? Same year we planned the vineyard, 2012. 2012, okay. Same cool. year, same year my son was born, Grace's grandson. August Walker. Mm -hmm. uh, 2012 was a big year for me. So I remember because <laughs> we planted two vineyards. I had a son. We opened the tasting room. Emily and I moved downtown Santa Barbara above the tasting room with our son, August. So. 
Yeah, I remember, I, and I met I you. Asked, yeah, well, then I asked because we started hanging out quite a bit back then. And then we had some pretty exactly. fun times in New Orleans and New York and <laughs> uh, all over Santa Barbara here and there. Uh, so, so anyway, but now now that you move north of the San Inez Mountains, I hardly I see, never you see you. Anymore, so, yeah. I know. <laughs> well, Aaron, about about the ageability of the Pali wines, it's not really your intention to make um, wines that age for a long time. I I imagine. Um, that they're they're made to be enjoyed uh, younger. I mean, they're they're we more approachable. Try and do it all. It depends on the wine. We 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 try and do a little bit of everything. To be honest, like the for sure the Huntington and the lower price wines. Absolutely, we're we're intending to sell those and op have people open those pretty quickly. The uh, the single vineyard more expensive wines. Um, we we hope that those are. We intend for those to be more age age worthy. Um, they don't always work out that way. Sometimes we go a little over the overboard with the ripeness, and um, and that doesn't help with the ageability. But um, you know, most of the vineyards we work with tend to have great acidity. Um, so even when we pick at higher ripeness, we still have a great core of acid and a low pH that helps that allows the wines to age pretty nicely. Um, but um, yeah, especially in our early day. I, but that's a fair question too, because early on when we first started out we were definitely going more in that that big over over the top ripe style which was the trend back in the early you know mid 2000s when loring was making our wines and that was his style that he was very well known for and so um but we've we've throttled that back you know we're not we're not trying to go big over the top <clears throat> we we still oh. like the the riper fruit flavors but um you know having a balance with acidity is important when, when you um you know we all talk about ripeness and we all have a different idea of what that is um what bricks do you normally shoot for to get the ripeness that you're 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 looking for it you know it it's changed especially a year like this year i've been looking more at the ph and the acid levels than the ripeness um yeah when we have these extreme heat heat waves uh you know that oh. the right the sugars were jumping but the ph's were still low and so that was telling me that you know the, the grapes might be ripe with sugar but they may not be physiologically ripe, as they say, you know, there may still be a lot of green and vegetal flavors in there. And so, so that's when I start looking at the acid levels or the pH levels to help guide me. Um, but it's also a matter of looking at the grapes, tasting the grapes, looking at the seeds, making sure they're not bright green, wanting, you know, more browning in the seeds, things like that. So, yeah. um, but to answer your question, I, you know, our wheelhouse is, for our mainstream wines is kind of in that 24 to 26 brick range, which, you know, I know some Pinot producers really balk at or think that's too ripe, but, um, but that's worked really well for our style. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and you mentioned pH. Um, I often think that pH is as much an indicator of physiological ripeness as uh, sugar. I think more so in some years yeah. than sugar. Yeah. 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 No. Good. All right, let's let's uh, move on to these hitching post wines here. Thank you, Aaron. We'll we'll come back to you for your for your Pinot after um, after these hitching post wines. And feel free to jump in if you've got uh, anything to say about Gray or Frank. I'm sure they'd love to love to hear it. So, um, Frank, I mean, a lot of people I think know your story and how you got into wine and and all that. But give us give us a kind of quick encapsulation of uh, you know how you went from um, hitching post family restaurant to uh, being one of the first you know first winemakers around here, really. Well, we were in the early, uh, we got interested very, very much early. And it was, uh, I came back from going to school at UC, UC Davis, studying environmental planning, did not even step into the winemaking department. But I used to stop um, on the drive back and forth uh, to Davis at Wybell Winery up in the mountains west of San, east of San Jose and buy uh, Green Hungarian. That was the first cork bottled <laughs> wine that we used, to, we used to enjoy, a sweet uh, uh, white wine. It's got a, um, it's got was, a nice ring to it. Green Hungarian. <laughs> Green Hungarian, you know, which is a big step up from, um, you know, uh, Carrari and Hardy Burgundy and things that we drank in, in school. And um, I came back to my family's restaurant and um, uh, to, to run the bar and be the wine buyer out of default. We didn't really have a wine buyer. We had all Paul Masson brought the wines. And um, uh, I became the buyer because people were interested in good wine back in the, in the late 70s, a lot of uh, 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 civilian engineers coming to Vandenberg Air Force Base, and uh, to and they'd come to the hitching post in Casmelia. That's when we were in Casmelia, and uh, fell in love with wine. Decided I wanted to try to make it, try to find a, a friend. Uh, and everyone said, "You want to make 
homemade wine, you know, uh, and all I could think of was a tie, a tie in sort of rot gut, um, high sugar, high alcohol, residual sugar. Um, cause the Italians, they just get these ripe grapes and they throw more sugar at them cause that it's gotta make it better. And it would be high alcohol and sweet and they drink it. Well, I said, no, these are dry. These are table wines that go with food and, and no one understood until I called Gray Hartley and he said, I'll be there in a minute. And uh, that was 40 years ago. <laughs> and, and Gray, you were, you were a salmon fisherman or, or like all, all sorts of fishermen, mainly salmon up in Alaska. Half yeah. Year, right? Yeah. I started fishing salmon in uh, 71. Frank and I met in 76 and <clears throat> 79. He called me up and said, Hey, uh, you just got back from Alaska and, I've asked all my friends to come help me make wine and nobody's interested. They think it's a crazy idea. Rot gut wine. What are you talking about? And uh, Frank said, will you help me? And I said, sounds like a great idea. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring my, I'm going to bring my girlfriend and I'm going to come to your house at six o'clock in the morning and you have the coffee ready and I'll bring croissants. You know, croissant sounds French now, doesn't it? <laughs> and so girlfriend, uh, I, his fiance he was getting married in less than uh, two months. Well, that's right. My fiance. <laughs> More French. <laughs> oh, yes. So uh, I, I said, I bring my dad and I'll bring my Super 8 movie camera. We'll take movies before before the dew is off the vine. And and then we went out and made Merlot our very first year. So and, I, and from the, from the very mistaken, beginning. Where was that from? Um, that was uh, Merlot from Firestone Vineyard. Um, oh, cool. Tony and there must have been a a fun energy happening at that time. And you guys could feel something was happening, right? Oh, well, you know, the Sanford and Benedict 1976 Pinot Noir uh, turned people's heads all around the world that uh, sort of lit everybody up after we had made Merlot. We, uh, you know, we were dying to make Pinot Noir. There was no grapes available. We went to Napa. Um, let's see if it was 1980, got Cabernet from Villa Mount Eden, which was, great but it was just too far and we wanted to make something local uh we're um tony austin at firestone vineyard uh, turned us on to sierra madre vineyard up in santa maria at the same time that richard sanford had left sanford and benedict was making his first sanford wine out of sierra madre rick longoria was making wine from there ken volk was the uh, uh, wild horse was making pinot noir from sierra madre and that's when we fell in love with that grape and uh you know the rest is kind of history we've been pinot noir nuts ever since Right, right. So this yeah. is the one we're drinking first here, the, the St. Rita's Earth. Um, and uh, tell us about, I mean, I think one of your guys' smart strategies al along the way, uh, amidst many of them, um, was to not just worry about which single vineyard you were pulling it from, because it gave you a little more flexibility year to year to make wines that still had a familiar brand, you know, sub brand name to them. So St. Rita's Earth has been around for a while. And the next one, Perfect Set, has been around for a while, too. So Tell, tell us about that strategy and why that's worked for you guys so well. Well, you know, we're, um, we, we, we buy grapes and we make wine. So we don't, we don't have any estate vineyards or own any vineyards. So we're basically somewhat like negotiants, except we make the wine and we're, we uh, control the whole aspects of when the grapes are picked and, uh, and do the whole winemaking process and work with the best vineyards in the region. We didn't want to be... Uh, tied to a vineyard necessarily uh, uh, for fear that we'd lose the source. Um, so we still, we make vineyard designated wines, but our main, our main emphasis is to create blends of Pinot Noir in different price, price points, different styles. Um, it allows um, us to be able to go through the whole winemaking process, keeping everything separate and making blends at the end towards certain styles. The St. Rita's Earth, would be styled towards, towards real drinkability. So the vineyards that we put in there um, don't have as low a pH or as much of a tannin structure, have more obvious fruit. The, uh, the St. Rita's Earth would be 80% from the Rio Vista vineyard in the Santa Rita Hills, which is in the far eastern part of the Santa Rita Hills, the warmest, probably the warmest vineyard in the Appalachian. So mm -hmm. hence the pH is run a little bit higher and um, and make a little more accessible, more drinkable. Cause we're always, we're always shooting um, for a little lower bricks than, um, than Aaron would shoot for uh, 23, 24 bricks is our, is, is our uh, sweet spot. 
we're looking for an alcohol in the 13s, uh, 13s to 14, maybe 13, two or four, but mostly 13, five, 13, eight uh, range. We just think it goes better uh, uh, for food. We make a more gentle wine that matches up with food, food better. So this St. Rita's would be uh, 80% from the Rio Vista Vineyard and, and then the other 20% from Sanford and Benedict, um, okay. and it, I think it's pretty uh, pretty drinkable style. Not not necessarily very age worthy, but uh, showing some rather uh, uh, mature fruit character. And, uh, and to some extent, you indicate that uh, compared to the other wine, which is cork, you you have this as a screw cap. And I know screw caps can age, and we we don't need to go into that debate. But it does indicate to me, especially if you have if there's a winery that has multiple wines in the portfolio and one and some of them are screw cap and some are not it makes me think let's drink that one now and save this one for next year or whatever right i mean that's one of the strategies for that exactly well we kind of picked a price point you know like 35 retail or less was going to be in in screw cap and they're going to be the more approachable wines and um and listen if it's not going to be in the bottle for 10 years why waste a cork i mean it's right. it, it's um I don't know. It, it just seems to work. We follow the same strategy with ours. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And what's uh, what is the retail on on Saint Rita's Earth typically? Um, you see it anywhere from twenty five to thirty four dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, full markup thirty four, um, mm -hmm. but you see it at, at twenty five dollars, even less in some places. Uh, it's crazy what the markups people use sometimes to, right. to move wine. Um, and, I think. It's and you're still. More, you're not just a winemaker. You're still running your restaurant, too. I would be the general manager of the restaurant. Um, yeah. I uh, I mostly have to fix things when they're not right, uh, get everything rolling. Of course, since the COVID, it's been uh, adjustments every, um, you know, every day. sometimes daily. <laughs> uh, some You know, like we can't be a restaurant today. Tomorrow we're going to be a takeout, and then we're going to open up inside, and then that closes, and then we made a tent. Uh, 200, uh, 250 feet from the restaurant. That's gorgeous view and a, a wonderful dining dining room. Um, and we're doing that right now. We haven't moved back in, but now we're planning to move the tent right back to the restaurant. So there's going to be another huge move uh, when the time changes in November because it's going to be dark. We don't need the view out out by the riverbank, but eventually we'll build the riverbank uh, into an outdoor restaurant uh, event space out there because it's so fantastic but yeah i'm a, a but at harvest time i'm not a restaurateur at all i leave it up to my crew i got great people that 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 are so dedicated and working so hard now you just can't believe how hard it is in the restaurant business right now matt it, it's and and we're not you know it's not all uh, customers that appreciate what we're doing there's some people that are really upset and it's hard. Right. It's hard on staff, and we're working our And I have my. I got to take my hat off to to my crews. They are just amazing. And so for harvest, I get to be away and be a winemaker. And for me, it's the joy of my life to uh, create wines. Um, it, it's like a, a miracle every every season. Uh, it 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 revitalizes me like you can't believe. I work harder than any other time of year, but it's. The, the creativity of taking grapes and making them into this beverage in a process that takes, um, you know, the immediate uh, one month of fermentation is, is quick, but then the evolving in barrel for a year or two years, and then the, the putting things in the bottle and having them develop over a, a whole bunch more years. It's just, and then to have people appreciate it and actually buy <laughs> the things that we make. Uh, right. Wonderful. Right, Frank, is, Frank, Frank is never happier all year long than while he's making wine. The kid is like uh, back Christmas morning underneath the tree for the whole crush. He's just giddy with excitement, and putting his hands and tasting and finding out about what's going on everywhere and finding good deals. And boy, he's a blast to be around uh, all year long, but he really gets going here. Perfect set. Do you know what that name means, uh, Matt? Uh, I believe you told me, but I don't remember now <laughs> on the spot. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for asking. 
thank you thank, so much for thank asking. You for, getting, for forgetting that. <laughs> yeah. I guess nice it's yes. Yes, I know. Let's move on. Right, okay. story. <laughs> of course I know. How dare you? <laughs> All right. 1979, I was uh, fishing on the west coast of Prince of Wales Island, a little place called the Haystack and uh, Noise Island. I set my net out and held it out for 10 minutes. And when I closed up and the fog lifted, we caught 40,000 pounds of sockeye salmon, $60,000 gross in 10 minutes. And my crew members each made $6,000. And that was a perfect set. Wow. And so, so when Frank asked me, Gray, we just... We just tasted these six barrels in 2006, and they were just amazing. And I put chalk on them to, uh, with musical notes saying that they were singing. So we went back to those barrels. We thiefed from each of those into a wine glass. And before we even really got it to our nose, we knew we had something special. And after tasting it, Frank said, what are we going to call this, Frank? And I said, hell, this is a perfect set. And that's how fast that name came about. And, of course, it also relates to what happens in the vineyard in the spring. When everything comes together. <laughs> and the, and On the, the grapes are the, the grape cluster for flowering, and the, and the grapes are created. And uh, if it happens correctly and it happens uh right it it's it's not all spread out with a variable crop it's all consistent and that would be a perfect set in the vin in the vineyard uh, we also thought that the hitching post restaurant was a perfect set for the movie <laughs> um so it has a lot of meaning meaning to us we started making uh, of course the highliner which was uh of course made famous in sideways back in 1996 96. and that was our idea also again in creating and using different vineyards to make basically our best wine of the vintage. And it started uh, uh, with blending Biennacito with the Sanford and Bennett vineyard. And it mostly has stayed uh, um, in that aspect, blending Santa Maria Valley with Santa Maria Hills ever since. We thought we would, um, with the perfect set, use the same idea to try to take the best vineyards of the Santa Rita Hills, be able to create our best wine of Santa Rita Hills in a vintage. And uh, and our idea is to make something extremely elegant um, that's re really refined and will have a wonderful structure to age um, age for ten or fifteen years. I mean, um, this would this wine would be fifty percent from the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard, twenty five percent from the Fiddlestick Vineyard next door to Sanford and Benedict. And then 25% from the Rio Vista vineyard, just, just up the road going east. And for us, it was the best we could do in the Santa Rita Hills that year. And, um, and I think it just shows such a dramatic difference in style from drinkability to uh, ageability that's still enjoyable in the state it's in right now. Um, but it's very res restrained and refined, the, the perfect set compared to the St. Rita's Earth that just kind of comes out. Uh, and and I, I, I love the comparison. Right. No, it's a nice, it is a nice combo. Um, is there anything, I'll, I'll go to Gray first on this and then and come to Frank with your different, si uh, not side careers, main careers or half careers. But was there anything in fishing, Gray, that, that other than coming up with nice names for wines, uh, was there anything that instructed you as, as to how to approach winemaking? Was there anything you learned from, that career that you've applied to winemaking? Well, wine sales? attention to detail, uh, always trying to have uh, the forethought to have your, your spare parts and things that are going to keep you from being stranded. Um, Frank and I have worked that one out pretty early on. It's a lot of fun um, getting ready for the crush and having everything ready in hand. Um, so there's an aspect yeah. about fishing that is, if you don't fix it, you die. You die. So we are constantly, Gray can, uh, um, we can find things that we need to do and Gray can get it done. He will have, found, he would have talked to somebody. 
in his, um, you know, networking that where somebody had something that we could use to work for the situation we've had. We, uh, we've worked at always at different people's wineries and, um, in our little business, I'm the winemaker, which is the guy that, that smells it and thinks about it and says, we need to do this. And Gray's always been the cellar master one that is just as important as the winemaker to figure out how to make that happen in the winery. And we've done so many tricks, invented things. Um, it's been such a wonderful collaboration. It's hard to believe. You know, you've got a, um, a liberal Democrat. Well, and that's the hardest and, uh, the and, hardest part of winemaking is selling it. And great <laughs> personality-wise, I think that's right. it plays a pretty, well, pretty here, good role there, too. And here, here's the other part of it. When Frank says, uh, we need this tool, it, it's going to do this. And so I I reach up into my, snap my finger, and there it is. There you go, Frank. <laughs> Yeah, well, you wish it was that easy. Uh, I know. <laughs> That's the romance. The romance. Well, and yeah. Frank, and for you, and, and I've heard you, you've told, we've talked about this before, but what does being a, a chef, a, a, you know, a renowned wow. grill master, barbecue chef, what has that taught you about the winemaking process? Well, coming from a family restaurant that cooked over this wood fire, and we were very specific about burn, uh, the wood can be real dramatic, um, uh, smoky, overpowering character. And you have to moderate, you have to burn a really clean fire to make a, a smoke that, that adds to, um, to an entree, to a piece of beef or a, a vegetable and doesn't uh, overpower it. And so we bring that to winemaking with the, the wines because we, we like the, 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 the taste and smell of new oak, but we like it in moderation. We like it to be a, a just a one aspect. And um, it's, a, it's a matter of, and also with the blending of the different vineyards to make flavors, we're not trying to make the biggest wine ever. We're trying to make a, a, a wine that has complete taste and has uh, structure and ageability. We have to make wines that are drinkable now because as a restaurateur, we're, well, you know, we don't send it away to have people taste. We pour it right to them and it better taste good now. But we're also pack rats and love to age wine. So this uh, dichotomy of uh, walking the tightrope to make wines that are drinkable and wines that are ageable. It's the story of Pinot Noir. Um, every aspect of decision making is a, is a balancing act of uh, walking down this tightrope of of um, pros and cons and coming up with uh, with your style and what you're going to do and every aspect of of winemaking of growing the grapes and and when the grapes are picked and what we do in the cellar all makes the wine different from the next guy, which is wonderful. Thank goodness, you know. You know, when you talk about the subtlety of the oak and not having it overpowering, I've always likened the amount of oak on wine very much like a scarf over a beautiful woman's shoulders, something that would be a, an accoutrement to her ensemble, not to dominate, but to accent subtly. So not a big pink good. fuzzy boa. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Great. Well, hey, I, 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 I was just going to ask. Sorry, Matt. Um, no, definitely. But to Frank's to Frank's point about making wines that are age worthy and age, uh, you know, that that will age well. Um, being that we're focusing on Santa Rita Hills, I mean, I feel and love to hear your thoughts on it that the Santa Rita Hills provides the perfect playground for making wines that you can not only get right but also will age well over a very long period of time because they seem to really hold on to their acidity really well, oh, even at higher breaks. Yeah, and I wonder uh, about that uh, uh, because uh, my preference of styles is, is balance. Ageability, it has to do with balance as much as any anything. So the, when the fact that we can make these ex pretty ripe wines um, and still have acidity, um, the fruit will start to fade later on and the alcohol will be more apparent and it, it and it is apparent even when they're young uh, but it makes them dramatic and wonderful to enjoy when they're young and um, and but it's just my preference of uh, matching food with wine in a very uh, elegant way that is that is just of course just my own preference 
I think Gray likes wines that are that are richer and more obvious. Um, and when we actually, when we're making blends, um, I, I, me and Gray do that part together. And um, I'm always making austere, uh, really um, angular, basically non-drinkable blends. And then Gray will go, oh, you know, this is, you know, if we could get it a little rounder and be, be more obvious. And I, I have to remember that sometimes when I'm tasting as a winemaker, and basically uh, uh, from the theory that you never want it to go bad. <laughs> you never want to go. And so uh, you'll put up with <clears throat> structure for the long term and sort of say it's good when in fact it isn't even, it's not showing its goodness yet. It's good. You're thinking 10 years ahead, like you're playing chess. And, uh, and we have to be careful as winemakers that we make wines that are approachable and drinkable and, that, and grace that influence. And we got to be able to sell them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> nobody's gonna. We're not gonna make it by saying, "Hey, buy this and put it away for ten years." They're not gonna come back right. next yeah. year and listen to that story again. You know, buy it, <laughs> and save it for trust 10 us. Years. Trust us. Trust us. Yeah, yeah, just buy more and don't open it though. Yeah, yeah. I, I will. I will say, I've had I've had the unique pleasure, I think three times now, of being at at Frank's table during the. Um, the vendors association gala um at the it's been to the car the last i don't know six years or so but it's uh it's every two years and and frank always brings some old wines to bust open and they're always just fantastic so i mean even going back to the 80s and stuff like that it's um i love drinking wines right away and i love when those wines last for a really long time too so and um, mac you got to host uh, you got to be the uh master of ceremonies when we had the the uh, celebration of 40 years of the Sanford and Benning Vineyard, where we right. showed uh, 40 years worth of wine under that at, at the old Sanford and Benning barn. Just an right. epic, epic event. And uh, there was wines. I, I remember tasting a Riesling that Sanford and Benning Winery made from like, um, I don't know, it was like 77 or 78. It was glorious. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. So Aaron, let's, let's, uh, let's finish up here with, uh, your Pinot, uh, from the yeah. Pali Vineyard. Um, and you make, how many different Pinots do you make these days? Um, we're, <laughs> it's a tricky question, but <laughs> he doesn't bottle... have that many fingers and toes. Feels like every no. couple of years I ask you and you go, we're going smaller. No, we're getting more. We're getting, more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So we've we've reduced the number of vineyards that we're buying from, but we've increased the number of bottlings of Pinot Noir that we produce each year because we're doing so many different things off our own vineyard. Um, but like to answer clonal, the question, clonal or block or mm -hmm. yeah, all yeah. sparkling. Um, yeah. We're I even did a pet. I'm doing a pet nut this year for the first time, uh, made from Pinot Noir from our grapes. Um, not that's not going to be a Pally wine. That's going to be our new our newest brand, Neighborhood Winery. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, as Pally, we bottle on average about 10 different Pinot Noirs each year in bottle. Um, but then we also offer wines on tap in all of our tasting rooms that we don't offer in bottle. So we have, um, we just started doing a natural, natural style Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from our vineyard as of last year, 2019. That's, um, well, the idea was it was only going to be available on tap in our tasting rooms, but we actually ended up bottling a portion of it a few months back and now all the distributors that we work with or not all but some of them are getting really excited and want us to make more of that wine so um so we've added another skew that we weren't intending to do but um that's what happens you know we 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 like you said we we think we're reining it in and and reducing the number of skews or bottlings that we do each year but then we end up making something new and fun and it, it catches on and people want more of it so we end up making more wine again so it's, if it's the uh, buyers it's, that want more i mean what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> that's a good problem to have, as they say. Yeah. You, you want to be able right. to sell it. You know, it's it's a good thing when you sell out of a wine and people are waiting for the next release. You know, that's definitely. Yeah. A, What's your case um, production, you know, Aaron? How many cases you make? Uh, we're, we've been around between 20 and 25,000 cases annually for the last four or five years steady. Um, and But that includes all three brands, not just Pally Wine Company. You know, Pally is... 
only focused on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. That's all we bottle under the Pali brand. Um, and then we've got our other two brands, Tower 15 and Neighborhood Wines, which are more experimental or, um, well, Neighborhood Wines is more, less, is less conventional winemaking, more of the natural style wines, pet nats, things like that. Uh, Tower 15, we're doing a lot of Bordeaux and Rhones under that label. So, um, but so all together, it's about 25,000 cases a year. Plus we do, we're, our tasting rooms go through a lot of kegs of wine um, more and more each year. We do, we have eight wines on tap at all, at all of our tasting rooms. We offer you the refillable growlers. Like, you have a number of tasting rooms. Where are they? Five. Five. We have, um, each one has a different artwork. So th this t-shirt represents our Lompoc tasting room. Uh, in the wine ghetto, which is not far from the winery itself. Santa Barbara in the funk zone was the original, the OG tasting room for Pali uh, back in 2012. Um, the success of that one being in an urban, more downtown setting um, gave us, gave I say us, but it was more, you know, our owner, Tim, that had the inspiration to replicate that idea and move it down into Southern California. So San Diego and Little Italy, um, Orange in Orange County and Anaheim in the packing district and then downtown LA in the arts district, which is our newest tasting room edition. That reminds me of the time we hung out in San Diego too. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's say, a yeah, darker yeah. story. <laughs> we'll not, we won't go to that one. <laughs> uh, oh, so yeah. where, where does, <laughs> go ahead, Brian. I got one more question for Aaron. Um, um, you guys have been buying grapes for years um, and, and been really successful at it. And then you decided to, to, um, plant a vineyard and i just also wanted to i want to know why and that's the main <laughs> question but i also want to point out <laughs> the incestuousness of all of this uh you mentioned barbara satterfield that, that, yeah. that helped you get a job at pally and barbara has been working for the hitching post for we, the older we get the more we don't want to say how many years we've been doing this stuff um <laughs> and and if I'm not mistaken, you've planted that vineyard on her family's property um, uh, west yep. in the western part of the Santa Maria Hills, the Machado Ranch. Um, the Brewer Clifton has a vineyard on that ranch, and I think someone else is Melville. Uh, oh, Melville. Melville. Has a yep. there is that. So what made you do it, man? <laughs> hey, it's not my money. <laughs> and how's that going? <laughs> Well, you know, so well, so silver lining to all the fires up north this year is we've had a lot of interest in grapes from our vineyard from buyers up north. Um, so that's, you know, somebody else's tragedy has become our, um, not success, but, you know. Uh, Stabilization because anyway, we're going to be yeah, super low this well, year, right? Exactly, kind of yeah. So, stabilize. So, how yeah, we How many acres is the family? 50, 50 acres 50 planted. Acres. Yeah, and... Um, you know, up like Matt was just saying, we we were struggling to find buyers this year to take some of our grapes because it was more. You know, the vineyard's producing something like two hundred eight, uh, two hundred tons off that fifty acres, and we don't need that many grapes. Um, so we were looking to sell off some of those grapes this year, and it was a really soft market. There was no buyers out there. There's too much Pinot Noir planted throughout the state, um, and then these fires happen, and now all of a sudden there's a huge demand for any Pinot Noir grapes that you can get your hands on, um, especially if you're a producer up north. Um, so, so that's really changed the whole dynamics of the supply of Pinot in the state for this year, anyways. But um, yeah, that's we Aaron, we Aaron. replanted. Can I ask you, are you in yeah. charge of the sales projections that you would plant a 50 acre vineyard? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so I, I just follow my marching orders. You know, Tim, <laughs> our owner, he, he makes all the big decisions. He, this, you know, the planting the vineyard was definitely his idea and, and his desire. And, um, you know, and to be fair, it, it actually has been beneficial. We've not had to buy grapes from, you know, we used to buy from great sources like Lucas and Llewellyn and River Bench and, um, but having our own, you know, control oh, over our own property has been a great benefit. Absolutely, uh, Aaron. And I would say the Walker family will be saying thank you very much. God bless uh, <laughs> your boss. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shoot. So Frank, Frank uh, are but you it's, saying you don't, you don't want to plant a vineyard? Well, you can see that. <laughs> he doesn't have to say I've it. Always, <laughs> I've always said there's just not enough time of day to run a restaurant, make wine, and plant a vineyard. And there isn't, and uh, but we also have always known 
that there's a lot of in our part of it there's a value added situation that we can and, and less risk that we're taking even though every year me and gray push a million dollars out on the table and say you know i think we're going to make something that people somebody will buy in a year or two um it's a gigantic bet i come from a gambling family my family goes to the shumash casino and to las vegas and they always want me to go along uh, but i said no i'm doing my gambling in the uh, making wine that's <laughs> I already wine made gamble. my bet <laughs> yeah yeah but uh boy okay. so growing grapes farming is of course the you know they're right up there with for me with teachers as as some of the most uh honored occupations that there is uh and uh i don't count myself as one of them and uh, and for I, me it was i i was really excited obviously it's not my money so if somebody's going to plant a vineyard and i get to be a big part of it it was pretty exciting and low risk for me but um you know, I started out working in the cellar and I learned everything I know about winemaking, doing it hands on and, you know, getting my hands dirty. And that was the route that I focused on first was the winemaking part of it. What happens in the cellar once the grapes come off the vine. And so my, my knowledge and education and my experience in the vineyard was very limited until we planted our own vineyard. And then I was thrown into overseeing the production and now the management of that vineyard. And that's allowed me to really understand grape growing a lot better than if I had not, if we had not had our own vineyard. And so I well, feel tell, that, you know, it's been tell us huge. about the 17, um, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think this is a great segue from your wines, which is you very um, accurately described as elegant and beautiful and not over the top. You know, we, we tend to go, as we've been talking about a, a bit riper with our style and this wine should reflect that. Um, it seems we're probably using about similar amount of new oak on these wines. Uh, for us, it's about 50% new oak barrels. Um, tasted like yours is probably about the same, I would think. Um, we're, we're bottling about 250 cases a year as our estate PNOR, which is what this is. And it's meant to be a reflection of the best blend of all the blocks of our vineyard. So we have nine different blocks, seven different clones of PNOR being grown. And when we're putting together our estate PNOR, we're looking for about 20 barrels that are going to be representative of the vineyard. Um, so trying to include most, if not all, clones. And then we pick out what we think is the best representation of the vineyard using about 50% new barrels, the other 50% being uh, older, more neutral barrels, um, and allow it to age for uh, 18 months. 16 to 18 months is generally about the amount of time that we let it age. Um, so this is a, this where, where blend specifically it in your other in like in the scheme of your pinots, do you find it like in the middle of your style or to the riper side or less ripe side or what do you, I mean, how do you, this is definitely, down? yeah, we're, we're definitely going in the riper, riper style. Um, our entry level pinots, Huntington and Riviera are done in a ripe style as well, but we don't use nearly as much new Oak and we bottle those wines much younger. So we only, give those about 10 months of aging before bottling. Um, and we use about half the amount of oak, only maybe 20% new oak on those lower price, more entry level Pinots. Um, our estate Pinot Noir is meant to be uh, more extra, a little bit more extracted, uh, definitely more expressive, um, but also with more well integrated oak from the 50% new oak, French oak barrels. Um, and that extra time of aging in the barrel too, you know, on the leaves, we typically, unless we need to, we typically don't rack off the leaves. We like, I, I like the wines to age on the leaves. It seems to give them more uh, character and, and um, body, um, just better mouthfeel. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's meant to be a, a rep, you know, kind of a statement about how good we can grow, make Pinot off the Santa Rita Hills property that we manage. Great. Um, great. great. Um, well, we've almost taken up an hour of everyone's time, including wow. your own time. Uh, it's been a great conversation, I think. Uh, Gray, you have any parting words for your son-in-law? I mean, you, he's turned out all right, it seems like. Oh, yeah, he has. <laughs> he's, on the, he's on the back deck of our house. You guys are in the same house, yeah. Yeah, so, so we're we gonna, go. when he's done, we're going to come in and have – tacos with uh, it's taco Tuesday at the Harley house and the great kids are going to be running around. It's going to be fun. I think he was pointing straight at the Quinta Del Mar vineyard. Uh, great. Yeah, he was, he was. <laughs> I think he's coming in to join you right now. Yeah. 
Frank, you got anything uh, more you want to add here? I think we've been pretty pretty thorough here. But oh, this, uh, has been, this has been really nice, Matt. Thank you so much for look everything at that. you do for us, for all of us here. You're one of our biggest supporters, of course. And um, you know, here's to you, Matt. Uh, thank you very much. Here's to you guys. I got to wear my pith helmet. I, I don't get to wear that usually. <laughs> and I know you were going to get that out. I would have gone and got mine. <laughs> And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you had a good time and uh, learned something and tasted some fun wine. So support these guys and see you in a couple weeks. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. So